Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Warm welcome to you all. It's good to see you here today. We pray the Lord will bless us as we come to worship him. So warm welcome to you all. Warm welcome to anybody watching this service online. We pray the Lord will bless you as you worship God with us today. So it's good to see you here. The announcements are as on the announcement sheet. I hope that you'll take a note of those. Uh, today being Communion Sunday, we're going to be doing something slightly different, and uh, you'll notice a slight change in the, in the bread. Uh, there's gluten-free bread available in the vestibule, in the table. If you require that and haven't yet lifted it, please uh, nip out during one of the hymns, uh, but come back in again and uh, make sure you have the, the gluten-free bread if that's what you require. Also, after the service today, there will be an opportunity to meet for a cup of tea, being the first Sunday of the month. And you'd be most welcome to stay and chat, so please do that rather than rush away. You'd be most welcome to stay for some tea. You'll see that this evening there is a We Worship special event, and uh, you'd be most welcome to come along. That's at 7 p.m., and uh, refreshments are also provided then. You're very welcome to come. It's a very relaxed affair, and you'd be most welcome. That's this evening at 7 o'clock. Other events are, as usual, uh, through, the, um, through the week. You'll see there's a request for uh, Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes to be uh, given by next, returned by next Sunday. And then looking forward to Sunday the 17th of November. The process of election of new elders has been ongoing over the past few weeks. We are now at a stage of presenting names for your prayerful consideration. And so the Kirk Session give notice that we intend to present two names to a congregational meeting on the 17th of November after the morning service. Those two names are Andrew Blair and Andrew Paul. In keeping with the code of the church, should any voter desire to make any objection to either of them, they must do so in writing, identifying themselves and the reasons for their objections to the minister, that's me, as soon as possible. Without any sustained objection, the names of those selected will be presented individually to the congregational meeting. A poll of voters present shall be taken, and if two-thirds of those who vote in favour, they shall be declared elected. Those names will be put to you as a congregation individually at that congregational meeting. That's the formal bit uh, that has to be uh, read. And just one other uh, announcement then as well. Um, for, for some reason, my uh, phone line landline is not working so if you need me please contact me on my mobile or ring Richard Blair and he'll search you out or maybe he'll contact me that might be the better way of putting it so just if anybody has any issues sorry about that that's uh, I hope nobody's been trying to get me something that just developed over the weekend those are all of our announcements today <coughs> We read in Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple. And I will praise your name. For your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me and made me bold and stout-hearted. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. For your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. We come to praise the Lord with all our heart as we sing together Psalm 100. And we'll stand together as we sing, all people that on earth do dwell. Let's stand and worship God today.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to worship you and to praise your name today with our whole heart. We come thinking of all that you have achieved through your Son, Jesus Christ. How he willingly came to give his life away as a ransom for many. And today, our Father, in response to this good news, we come and we praise your name. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the way in which you have been honest and faithful and true down through generations. You have kept all your promises. You have indeed called people from sin and self to serve the Saviour. We thank you, Lord, that you are the Lord who has a plan for us, the one who enables us to know a purpose, a reason to exist, a reason to serve because of all that you have done for us. We come and we praise your name today. Lord, not only have you given us the privilege of seeing Jesus and putting our trust in him, not only have you enabled us to count our blessings, not only have you enabled us to see how your faithfulness has been extended to us over years and years, we thank you today. You're not asking us to remember things just in the past, but to experience the presence of the Lord God Almighty, of the Son Jesus Christ, by your Spirit in the present. Our Father, we pray that today, as we share in communion, as we come into your presence, we pray that we would be nourished and refreshed. Lord, we do not come lightly. We come as repentant people and we pray that you'd forgive us our sin. We pray that you'd cleanse us as we come before you. And we pray as forgiven people that our hearts will be full of thankfulness and praise as we recount again in our own minds and souls all that we have in Christ. And so we pray you'd bless us we pray that you would draw near to us. Do us good in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bible reading is from Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 9 to verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9 to verse 23. The theme today is really giving thanks. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you might, may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or authorities, rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once 
you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own word. Rather than bringing up boys and girls, uh, we're going to say a prayer together. The moderator has uh, asked us to take time during the services today to pray for the whole situation in the Middle East. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take time now to pray before our next praise. We have heard much on the news about Israel and Gaza. There's been all sorts of issues that have been taking place. And whenever you turn on the news, there are still more deaths and more destruction. The moderator, in conjunction with our church, has asked that today we take some time to pray for the whole situation, to pray that a remedy may be found whereby there could be a removal from this conflict, upheaval and distress to uh, peace. And so we're going to pray that our sovereign God would uh, intervene in this region and in other places too where there's so much issues. One of the things that you and I have to remember is that in these areas there are Christian people as well, both in Israel and in Gaza. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ at this time as well. So let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we take time today to pray specifically for the area around Israel and Gaza. It is something that has been on the news virtually every day for over a year. Today we remember still over 100 Israelis who have been held hostage, many underground. We pray for them today, that soon they may be released. We pray for their families that are disturbed and distressed. We pray that soon they would be reunited. Father, we pray for those who live in Gaza who have been civilians and who have lost loved ones in the great bombing raids and so on that have taken place. There is so much unspeakable suffering on so many sides. Our Father, today we pray for those who mourn and for those who are dealing with injuries and maybe as well a shortage of medicine. Our Sovereign Lord, we pray that you would intervene to end the war in the region because it is not only those who have been involved directly but also so many other uh, worries about wider conflicts as well. And we even see, Lord, maybe a wider stage where there are other countries seeking to whip up more conflict. We pray for those whose lives have been torn apart by this war, who have suffered terrible loss and grief, who today are struggling for water, food, shelter, medical care, and even psychological support. We pray, Lord, that you would draw near them and be with them today. We thank you, Lord, too, for your people who live in the Middle East. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our partner churches in these areas who are seeking to help in any way they can. We pray that they would have courage and strength to be able to stand for the gospel of Christ, the Prince of Peace. And we pray that you would enable them to continue with a witness that will be real and relevant in dreadful circumstances where they are. So we pray for your divine intervention, Father. We pray that you'd have an impact on the leaders and those in authority who have a choice about whether to release hostages, about whether to uh, allow food and aid into a certain area. 
We pray, Lord, for those suffering and grieving, those displaced with no home left. We pray, Lord, for emergency relief, whether that be from our church partners or Christian aid agencies or tier funds or other agencies. We pray, Lord, that that would be successful. And we pray, Lord, as well for hospitals and clinics and medical staff who are having to deal with dreadful, dreadful wounds in these days. And so today, our Father, we take time to pray for peace in the Middle East. And Father, even as we remember the Middle East, we remember the war in Ukraine. We know that there is dreadful events there day by day, even though it has slid down the, um, down the news uh, uh, agenda. We pray, Lord, for those who today are suffering in Ukraine. We pray that Russia would relent and withdraw, and that there would be peace in Ukraine. And today, Father, we also pray for those who have suffered great loss in Spain after the dreadful flooding events. We pray, Lord, for them as well. We pray, Lord, that there would be help for those who have been made homeless. We pray, Lord, to be help for those who are injured. And we pray for those who have lost loved ones. May you sustain them and keep them. And may they know and hear of Jesus today. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our next praise, uh, hymn 514. <coughs> My heart is filled with thankfulness. And after this, the boys and girls can leave. I think just primary school age, is not right? Primary school age, yeah. Primary school age, uh, leave for Sunday school. Everybody else can stay in uh, today. Thank you.
we want to take a look at Colossians 1 with uh, a specific look at verses 12 to 13. One of the joys I had earlier in the year was to have a family gathering. For a happy reason, it was a 70th birthday. No, it wasn't mine, thank you. It was a 70th birthday and it was great because so many of us said we've actually got together for a positive reason. Whenever you go through a stage of family life where you seem to be turning up all the time for funerals, it's lovely to be able to have a positive reason to come together, isn't it? And how often do family groups say, you know, oh, we'll have to try and do this on a happy occasion. What you do whenever you get together is you reminisce, you go back through, you think about what you've been through, how you've come on, and do you remember when? The silly things you did, the family uh, stories that are passed down through generations that are embellished and uh, talked about. One of the things that will happen at a time like that is usually there will be a showing of old pictures and we look at the styles and we look at the hairstyles or the fact that there was her then rather than now. Uh, and we look through those different things. We think about what it was like then compared to what we are now. We look at our children and we see how they've grown and ended up finishing university and going into jobs. How they maybe have children themselves. How those of us who are speaking together are now grandparents or uncles and aunties and the extended family that's grown. It's an amazing thing to be able to look and see where we have come from and where we are now. And it's nice if it's on a happy occasion. Whenever we come for our communion, believers are told to look at the death of Jesus Christ in terms of a past, a present and a future. One of the things that we do today is to understand what we have today. We see where we have come from. We see what we have in the present, the great changes that have been made. But we also look to our future. And the future is known. Maybe not the timing of it, but the future is known. And so we hold on to God in that way. Whenever we come to communion believers have the privilege of not only enjoying fellowship with God in the present but recounting of how far he has brought us and amazingly how far he will bring us and so we want to look at verses 13 to 14 and then verses 21 to 23 as well to see how God has changed our lives and the three reasons that there is in the middle of this passage as to why we should give thanks. In verse 9 we read that Paul has been praying for the church in Colossae. He's been praying for them but also giving thanks that God has been working in their heart and in their life. And verses 9 to 11 are really about reasons why he joyfully gives thanks. And it's an amazing thing to see how it ends up point coming towards uh, verses 13 uh, to 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. One of the amazing things is that Paul reminds us of where we were whenever God found us, of what we have become now in the present, but also of what we will be in the future. And one of the things that he does is he reminds us of where we were whenever God found us. It is an amazing thing to see, isn't it? He rescued us from the dominion of darkness. You and I should be under no illusions about how far God has brought us as a people. And not only does he tell us that in verse 13, but in verse 21, he also says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. 
Those words really bounce off the page, don't they? You were in the kingdom of darkness. You were alienated from God. You were without God, without hope, in the world. Alienated from God means that we were in a position where God didn't hear our prayers. We are estranged from God, on our own, with no real joy or peace or friendship that could be regarded as permanent because in the world everybody lives for their own self-interest. And if you didn't fit in with the right group at the right time, you'd suddenly be on your own. And rather than looking for help, we actually find that you were enemies in your minds. Do you see that in verse 21? Enemies in your minds. We still have that idea today where something happens and we ask, what's God doing? And we don't ask it in terms of for information. We ask that question with an accusing finger. What's God doing? If we ask why, whenever something bad happens, that's perfectly fine. Whenever we ask the why in terms of an accusing finger, pointing at God, that's a problem. And it's interesting to see here that before God worked in our lives, we were his enemies. Belonging to the kingdom of darkness, God's enemy instead of being his child. Ephesians chapter 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest of us, we were by nature deserving of wrath. What an amazing place to be. Without hope, without God in the world, people who are enemies in our minds were involved in evil behaviour, where we're living for ourselves and fighting against God. We're sinners lost in sin. We have failed to conform to or live up to the law of God. And we can't fool ourselves. First uh, John 1.10 says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. So the world is lost in sin. We were lost in sin. Belonging to the kingdom of darkness, quite content to remain there. Enemies of God, fighting against him. How is there any hope for us? The amazing thing is that in all of these verses, we have this word, but, and it's but God. What an amazing thing to see God's intervention. God has acted and it is amazing. And the more we understand where we've come from, the more amazing it is to know that Christians can be where they are now. In the presence of God and enjoying Christ. I love a quote. I've lost it many times. I've quoted this, but it's from a man called Robert Trail. And Robert Trail said this, Though there can be nothing more commonly said and owned than that all men are sinners and that all the acceptance of a sinner with God is through Jesus Christ, yet I can assure you that when a person sees and knows what it is to be a sinner and know what God is, it is a wonderful difficulty to believe that it is possible that such a sinner and such a God should ever meet in peace. And it is, isn't it? It is an amazing difficulty to behold that it is possible for people from verse 13 who were in the kingdom of darkness and verse 21 who are alienated from God and enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior should ever be able to meet a God in peace. But these same verses come out amongst other words that tell us how that has happened. I want you to have a little look at uh, verse 12. 
giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. He has qualified us. And verse 13, he has rescued us. And verse 14, through the work of Christ. It's in the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption. And so that's why we move from what we were to what we have now. Because what we have now is reasons to be thankful. It is God who has moved. It is God who has acted. It is God who has rescued. It is God who has brought us to where we are now. It is God who has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And that's why we're able to come to communion today. If we have accepted Christ as Lord and Saviour, then we have reasons to be thankful because our citizenship has changed. No longer are we in the kingdom of darkness, verse 13, but we've been brought into the kingdom of his Son. No longer are we under the jurisdiction of sin, but of Christ, we live in a new kingdom. Now, instead of the selfish cravings that we had that were ruling us, we can now glorify God. A great change has been brought about by God himself. He has set us free. We read in verse 21, you are alienated from God, enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. There's so much there, isn't there? But it's through Jesus Christ that all of this has been achieved. We have been reconciled. We have been made his friends after an estrangement. We have been made at peace with God, who enables us by the death of Jesus that we remember today to be brought into the presence of God. It's no wonder that Paul has a reason to say thank you. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. He gives thanks because he recognizes where we've come from to where we are now. Stories told of a Northwestern University that had a life-saving team that assisted passengers on Lake Missi Missi Michigan. I'm glad I started that story. Lake Michigan. And in September, the 8th of September, 1860, the Lady Elgin floundered near the campus and a ministerial student named Edward Spencer personally rescued 17 people off that ship. The problem was that the exposure from that episode permanently damaged his health, so much so that he was unable to continue for the ministry. Some years later, when he died, it was noted that none of the 17 people he had saved ever came to thank him. Pretty amazing, isn't it? What we have here in verse 12 are three reasons, verses 12, 13, 14, three reasons to come back to Jesus and give thanks to him in this communion Sunday. The first reason is that he has qualified us. He has qualified us to share in the inheritance. Sometimes people today want still to be able to say what they have done, what they have achieved, or the goodness in them has qualified them. Here it's very clear. It is the Father who has qualified us. It is God who has made it possible for us to come into his presence. It's a God who said, let light shine out of darkness that shone into our hearts, says 2 Corinthians 4. It is the God of heaven who made us children of light, 
in 1 Thessalonians 5. It is the God of heaven who enables us to be a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Sometimes people look to the future and they say, well, soon we'll come into the light. But scripture says that we've already passed into the light, the kingdom of light. And in the world that one day will pass away, we're sure that we're being brought into a kingdom that will continue to stand because God has qualified us. The second thing that we see we should give thanks for is that he has rescued us. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. If you're standing on the bottom step of a stairs and you have a little wobble and somebody steadies you, you'll say, thank you very much. If somebody dives into a raging torrent and pulls you out of a river, you will have a different kind of thank you, won't you? You'll have something that will be far more meaningful, more intense, something that will come from the heart as you thank them. Well, here we have a son who has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. By his death on the cross that we remember today, we remember the fact that he is able to transfer sinners who believe in him into the kingdom of light, into his kingdom, a kingdom that will never stop or diminish. Whenever we see this idea of him rescuing us and transferring us in terms of a kingdom, we remember what has been achieved that we have accepted, that we didn't work towards. We are full of reasons to give thanks to God. And the third and final reason why we're to give thanks is in verse 14, where he has given us redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The idea of redemption is where people are bought in a slave market and set free. That redemption price is paid. The slavery that they belong to, the redemption price releases them from that and they are now free. And that's exactly what we're told. Through the death of Jesus Christ, we have redemption. He has paid all of our debts, everything that we owed, so that we can be freed. What do we find? Three reasons to give thanks. Because God has qualified us, he has delivered us, and he has redeemed us. And so today we do not simply come to remember Jesus on the cross. We come to remember how he has brought us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. How he has qualified us to stand before God in him. And delivered us from everything that would separate us from God and redeemed us. Paid for our debts so that we can be free. And then he gives us a future, doesn't he? We look forward to being able to come before God as holy, without blemish, free from accusation. It's very different to what way things are now. Lots of people will be able to point to you and me and say, you know we're near perfect. And yet there is a future ahead. A future because Philippians 1, 6 says, we can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so friends, we have reasons to give thanks today as we come to communion. We have reasons to remember what we were, who we are now but also what we will be because he has qualified us, rescued us and granted us redemption. May we this day give thanks to God as we come to worship him. We're going to sing uh, our...
Third praise, when I survey, <coughs> excuse me, the wondrous cross, <coughs> and we'll uh, sing this, and it will ask the elders to meet at the front during this hymn. The table of the Lord Jesus Christ is open to all who profess the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We therefore invite anyone who loves the Lord Jesus in sincerity to join with us in this holy fellowship. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He also said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We meet here today mindful that we are sinners whose only hope is to be found in the work of Christ. The sacrament of communion reminds us of our need to hold on to Christ because it is only by his blood that we can find forgiveness of sins and be able to have communion with God. As we prepare ourselves, we sing the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, How Vast Beyond All Measure. Let's stand and worship God.
going to ask the elders to collect the tokens, please. Let us hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they've been handed down to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <coughs> For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and wine and gave thanks. And as we come to take these elements of bread and wine in the use of this communion, we too give thanks. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have a lot to thank you for. We have a lot to thank you for because of Jesus, who came and gave himself away as a ransom for many. We have found that our salvation is not something that we have achieved, but something that we have accepted by faith in Christ. He has done everything that needed to be done to such an extent that we ourselves are able to be qualified. That we ourselves are able to be confirmed as having been rescued from a kingdom of darkness where we were lost to where we have been found in the kingdom of light and whereby we have been redeemed. Where all our debts are paid. Where our freedom is secured. And today our Father we thank you for Jesus. He achieved something we could never have done for ourselves. And so today we come to remember his death. We give you thanks, our Father, for a lovely Saviour who was willing to go to a cross and bear all the punishment for our sins that was due to us and to pay the price that we could never have achieved. Our Father, we thank you that today we can speak of forgiveness as imperfect people, we can speak of the patience that you have with us. And we thank you, Father, the privilege of being able to say a meaningful sorry every day of our lives. And to know that the love of Christ never diminishes for us. But we look forward to a day whenever we will know perfection. Whenever we will be presented before the throne of grace through Christ as people who are holy who are free from accusation and who are presented before the throne of God and the beloved. 
We thank you and we praise you for these truths. And we pray that the reality of what we share now, this communion with you and with one another, may be something that is a reality that we carry with us into the rest of the week. So we pray you'd bless us today. John nearest and do us good, we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. According to the holy institution, example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ and for a memorial of him, we now do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink you all of it.
we read in Second John, I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. The reality of that, may it be ours as we seek to glorify our Saviour for all that he has done. Our closing praise is, it was finished on the cross. The lovely words uh, that remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus. Let's stand and worship God. Father, we thank you for the time we've shared together in your presence. We thank you for the refreshment that's been provided in the hall, and we pray that you bless our fellowship together there. And we also pray, Father, that we would know today the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.